Hello, hello, hello. Welcome in everybody. This is Create Smarter. I am Tyler Pyron of Five Tool Productions. I want to say thank you so very much for tuning in and joining us today on this lovely Thursday afternoon. It's actually a very nice day here in Boston. Well, just outside of Boston. We're located in Norwood, Mass. And we're having a great show today. We really do have a really awesome show lined up. We've got a ton of content, a lot of pre-produced videos. We've got the news segment, an in-depth interview that you're going to see in just a little bit. But the one thing I do have to make sure everybody knows is that our own Connor Cloggerty. It is his first day in the booth, in the hot seat, producing the show. So if you have any issues, make sure you call him. Connor's email is Connor at, no, I'm only kidding. We're not going to do that right now. But Connor has been instrumental to a lot of the stuff that we've been doing here at 5Tool. And we have been doing an awful lot as of late. Now, you probably notice a little bit more gray hair, a few more wrinkles. And that's because the last couple of months have just been nothing but absolutely crazy, especially the month of May. So before we move forward with the show, we figured, why not take a look back at the month of May and see everything that we did. Take a look. to see all the work that everybody kind of put in over the course of the last month really it has been a team effort all the way around and if as you saw there there was a lot of pre-produced content there were a lot of commencements a lot of live streams and everything in between we were on location we were here in the office or really you name it we were doing it last month and it really has just continued into the month of june as well so i can't wait for you to take a look at the june in review and that's one of the things that we're actually going to be trying to do on a monthly basis for everybody watching to give you an idea of some of the things that we have been working working on. You've probably seen some of the pictures and behind the scenes stories on Instagram itself, but we like to kind of give you a wrap up of everything that we kind of covered in the last month. And honestly, Phil and myself, we both kind of looked back and said, wow, that seemed like such a long time ago because of the amount of stuff that we continue to do. But good job to Marissa for kind of piecing that together. But now that we have done that, we have looked at what May was like, I think it's time to dive in. And the best way we know how to do that is by getting started with the news. So let's go to the news. So you saw that intro, which is pretty solid, if I must say so myself. It's time for the news. So with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and dive right into our very first topic, which is all about Facebook. So Facebook is no stranger to playing with some new pieces of technology, specifically 
hardware. Obviously, you know them more as a software company more than anything else, but they have dabbled in hardware from time to time, and there's some new stuff that they're actually going to be rolling out as well, something that goes on the wrist. So with that, we're going to go ahead and bring in Marissa Yaleski to talk a little bit more about the Facebook watch, if you will. So Marissa, give, give me the update. Well, what's going on with the, uh, the watch itself? So Facebook is coming out with a watch to sort of rival the Apple Watch. It's going to have two cameras on it, one on the front for video calls and one on the back. And supposedly they are detachable, um, so you can take them off of the watch face and use them. It's also going to have a heart rate monitor on it to track your fitness, sort of like a Fitbit um, in that way. But there are some concerns with that, given the fact that Facebook is not great with personal information. So we'll see how that goes over. But they've already poured, I think, a billion dollars into making the watch. So hopefully they know what they're doing. <laughs> I sure hope so. You know, a billion dollars <laughs> is no small chunk of change, that's for sure. No, it's definitely interesting. The, the whole detachable camera thing, th that seems just strange. I mean, I can only imagine the actual size of it. I think of it on the back of my phone. It's like the size, you know, half the size of a dime. How are you going to be able to pull that off on your iPhone, excuse me, not your iPhone, on your watch and go ahead and try to use that? I mean, it just seems strange. I don't totally understand it. I read it. I thought that it meant that the whole watch face was going to detach and you'd be able to kind of carry that around as a camera, which didn't make complete sense either. But at least that's bigger and, you know, you're able to hold that. Um, but apparently the, the back camera will be able to be taken off. So I don't know how small that's going to be. Um, and I wonder if the front one is going to stay in the watch so that you can use it for video calls. Um, but I don't know how, quite how that's going to work. <laughs> the one thing that I find really interesting about all of this is that the, the platform it's going to be built on is on Android. So I would like to think that it should, would be compatible with an Android phone or an Android device. But the one piece that I did think that was really, really cool or interesting when all is said and done is the fact that it is going to have LTE built into it. So it doesn't have to be paired with a smartphone, which is kind of a, you know, one of these to, and I don't know if you can see me right now, but one of those going over to Apple and saying, well, we don't necessarily need you um, to go ahead and work, which was kind of cool, but I don't know if that'll actually work or not. I'm not sure, but you know what? It kind of gives them a leg up because at least I have an Apple Watch and I can't use it unless I'm close to my phone and you can pay for an Apple Watch that you can use without being um, a certain distance from your phone. But that'll definitely be an advantage for Facebook to not have to be paired with that phone and to just kind of use independently. Um, but it definitely is sort of uh, one of those to, uh, to Apple. And of course, you know, you mentioned it right off the top. Probably the most interesting piece of it all is the kind of the heart rate monitor. And, you know, of all the companies in the world to have data, um, I think Facebook has screwed up the most with it when it comes to that. So I don't know how confident buyers are going to be when it comes to, you know, unleashing heart rate monitoring <laughs> to the world of Facebook, if you will, right? Yeah, I'm not quite sure how that's going to compare to Apple, at least Apple, you know, whether or not they actually um, are good with user information. They pride themselves on, you know, allowing privacy settings to be pretty understanding and you're able to switch them, especially with the new update um, on iOS now. I've seen commercials on TV that are like, oh, be as private as you want. Um, so hypothetically, Apple's better with the privacy settings than Facebook. So that's kind of where people are getting a little iffy on the whole idea of Facebook having the watch and having heart rate information, but hopefully they uh, will be as good as Apple claims to be with information. Who knows? We'll see if, you know, Cambridge Analytica just gets fed all of our data right away from my heart rate, which who knows what they'll do with it. I'm sure they'll find something. Marissa, good stuff as always. I'm sure we will talk to you very soon. Yes, thank you. Awesome. So that is Marissa Yaleski talking about uh, the Facebook watch. Now, the other thing that's interesting when we talk about Facebook is, well, they own another platform too. It's kind of pretty large. You may have heard of it. You know, it's Instagram. And one of the things that everybody always talks about when it comes to Instagram is in fact the algorithm, especially social media marketers. Everybody has a tendency to look into and say, okay, well, what's going on in the algorithm now? What's taking place? What are we going to be able to do with it? How are we going to be able to capitalize on it? on it as well. But with that in mind, a lot of people have gone ahead and said, all right, well, we're going to post a few times a day. We're going to leverage reels. We're going to leverage live. We're going to do a few different things, but no one's really been able to narrow down and say, here's what you need to be doing. Here's what you should be doing until now. I think, and the reason why I said that is because a recently deleted article directly from the source came out kind of explaining all there was about the 
well, the algorithm and what you should and shouldn't be doing right now. But as I mentioned, it's no longer there. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper right now. We're going to bring in Connor uh, Glargerty to discuss that a little bit more. Connor, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing well, you know, and uh, yeah, it's it's you bring that up. It's not, you know, usually we see someone kind of let us under the hood, like a big company like Instagram, and then suddenly a couple days later, take it right back and uh, delete the post. So that is definitely suspicious about that. <laughs> definitely suspicious to say the least. So t tell me, what did the article, when it was published, what did it say? Give me some of the nuts and bolts as to what they're they trying to explain how the algorithm actually worked. Because it used to be, you know, we were talking about this off camera. It used to be that it was all just, you know, based on when it was uploaded, when something was posted. And then they s switched it. And as I mentioned in the kind of the introduction, people tried to jump on board and try to figure out what was working. But this kind of, like you said, took a peek under the hood and see how it actually works. So w w how did it explain it? Yeah, so while the post actually was up and available to the public, it gave us a little insight on how the algorithm actually works, um, which has been kind of a mystery since back in 2016, like you were talking about how it went from chronological order to uh, controlled by an algorithm. So it gave us a little um, kind of idea of how that the inner mechanisms work, let's say, and what kind of data Instagram grabs from all you and your posts and what you engage with and uh, actually what it gives back to you on your feed. So when you first open the app, as everyone knows, it goes right to your feed. It shows everything that you follow. And that kind of works. It shows you your friends and your family's kind of post first or things that it thinks are your close friends um, that you're most in, you know, to engage with, to like, to comment, to share, to save to your collection, that kind of stuff. Um, because the feed in their mind is all about engagement, as much um, you know, engagement as they can get. And so you go out and talk to people. You go out and engage with those kind of posts. Um, and then it also talked about the Explore page, which is the second tab, um, where you find posts that you don't follow but are akin to things that you like, maybe your niches. Uh, so we were talking off camera about how I like soccer a lot. I don't follow a lot of soccer accounts on Instagram, but my Explore feed is constantly provided by soccer. So uh, it makes sense. It, it has gathered data of what I like and what I share when I comment about soccer. So it shows me a bunch of soccer accounts that I don't follow in the hope that I will follow them, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then moving on to the last thing it mentioned about Reels, uh, that is less about engagement, but more about entertainment. So they actually want you to you know, find things that are interesting, that are funny, that you might like, save, and maybe even make your own uh, Reels in the future. Uh, so the blog post was really good, just about kind of giving us a little information about how they worked in every different avenue from feeds to explore pages to reels, uh, which we didn't know previous. So now we get a better understanding of how to utilize that for, let's say, five tool or our own personal accounts, which is very cool. Yeah, that's one of the things I was going to say. It's actually important for a lot of our clients when we are creating content, and they always ask, "Where should this go? Where, what should this? What feed should this be in?" Well. No, I think we can kind of just give them exactly what you just said right there. And it's interesting when you talk about uh, Reels specifically, I think I've had the conversation with Marissa. I know I've had the conversation with my wife is that Reels can be a time suck. You can be entertained there for about 45 minutes and just keep scrolling, keep scrolling, keep giggling, keep sharing, keep laughing and share with, you know, I can picture my wife and I on a Saturday night. This is how lonely we can be at times, right? Where we're just saying, hey, look at this one. Did you see this one? Did you see that one? And it's just back and forth. So it is interesting that they're basically coming out and saying, yes, that's exactly how it works. So with, with that in mind, Connor, the loaded question I have for you is, why did they take the article down? Because that's the most interesting part of all of this. I mean, you, you hit it right on the head. That's a great question. And uh, we may never know the answer, which is the scary part. So it's like, can we trust what they said? Or did somebody, like you were saying, from higher up see something and say, why are you giving the public this information? The whole point of the algorithm is that they wouldn't know how it works. Something along those lines. So it is a bit scary. It's a bit suspicious, especially when a huge company like that has data on us. Uh, maybe not as bad as Facebook, but you know, uh, on our likes and shares and interests. So when they delete something, that gave us information, it's kind of gets your mind thinking of what did they share a little too much maybe. And of course, have we, as we've seen with Facebook, with Google and all their different updates to an algorithm, it could very well have changed immediately after that too. So it could be something new as well. So awesome. Connor, really appreciate you coming on as always. And we will talk to you very soon, my friend. Awesome. Very cool. So I guess with all that in mind, that'll do it for the news and back to Tyler. That's right.
Sure thing. Uh, so yeah, uh, really excited to be here on the show in front of the camera. Um, thanks so much for having me on, and I'm very excited. Uh, in just a few minutes, we'll hear from our, uh, our our first guest here, Mr. Our first and only guest, Mr. Peter Levine. Um, so Peter uh, works at Cambridge Community TV as his uh, uh, main gig, though he's not a man averse to some side gigs. Uh, he's their production engagement manager. And a pretty fun story with uh, kind of how I got to know Peter. About a year and a half ago, I was actually Peter's intern. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was really awesome. It was kind of a transitional moment for me. Uh, I would, had just graduated school. I wanted to keep making content like I did in school, but didn't know exactly the place to do it. So uh, I went to CCTV. I met Peter, and it was really kind of a, a match made in heaven. Um, so. Not only does Peter, he's a great internship manager, uh, he's a great content producer, but he also creates, uh, he also produces a lot of uh, awesome events himself. So we'll be bringing him on the show in just a minute to talk about uh, producing events, both in person uh, around the greater Boston area, as well as virtual events. Uh, but before we get to the man behind the content, I thought it would be cool if we take a look um, at the content itself. Um, so I edited together just a quick little sizzle reel, kind of for various uh, projects that Peter has produced, either for work or for himself or for who knows what. So it's pretty fun for me to be the one saying this. Uh, let's, let's roll that video. <laughs> Hi, I'm Peter Levine. I'm an actor among many other things to name a few. And this is my 2021 actors reel. Oh, didn't know you were already recording. Just kidding, there's no one here but me. In this life, I'm truly all alone. Joking, I have a friend. Anyways, today we're gonna to talk about lighting. Lighting is one of the most essential ways to elevate your video production. So where are you now? Well, Grandma, I'm in Boston. I live just outside of the city in a town called Somerville. And what do you do? Well, I produce content for a television station and also do some freelance work. It's hectic, but fun, and I'm, I'm really lucky to be able to do it. That's nice, dear. How are you, Grandma? I'm here today to talk about the only reason that I haven't gone viral is because I value my mental health. My mind is a temple, and though I have viral content in the can, I decided not to release it. Because fame does crazy things to a person. Hopefully, well, maybe, this might be <laughs> our last virtual festival, which might, I think is a good think thing. You could pull that off? I, I don't know. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. This was awesome. I hope you had a wonderful virtual time, and we'll see you in real life pretty soon. July. So. July. It'll be hot and heavy at the fest, so we'll see you there. It's going to be the heaviest fest. Awesome. And uh, with that, I'd love to welcome in our guest here today, Mr. Peter Levine, uh, founder and director of the Weird Local Film Festival, uh, which, as we might have just heard, uh, some are calling the heaviest fest in town. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for joining us here on the Create Smarter Show. Hey, thank you, Josh, for having me. This is great. Of course. Uh, it's always great uh, bantering with you. That's what we did for most of my internship. And Awesome to be doing it uh, on the internet here today. Um, so first off, uh, we kind of, I guess by starting with CCTV, I kind of buried the lead just a little bit with all your work with uh, Weird Local. Um, so I'd love if you don't mind, just uh, can we hear a little bit about the festival's history, uh, mostly as an in-person event in Somerville? Um, and then if you're fine with that, I'd also love to hear about kind of your transition, uh, taking that to a virtual event this past year as well. All right, I will try to not make this too long-winded, but that's not my strong suit as given by this preface. So uh, yeah, so I'm a, I was a musician primarily, but I started getting into video and me and my brother worked on a project and nothing that I made was ever getting viewed online. So we decided to have like a recital, which is, I was a cellist, so I would, I would give recitals whenever I did it. So we, we created a screening um, we scrapped something together. Um, and so me and my brother and a few friends that were making videos had a screening at a warehouse and it was so fun. So we decided to kind of create a regular event and realize that we couldn't create 
enough videos quick enough to fill a 90 minute program. So uh, sadly, we opened it up to the public so they could also have their stuff be uh, seen. So that's kind of how the festival began. So in 2017, August 2017, we had our first live event. And then, uh, you know, I, I don't have to tell you the story about how everything changed when the pandemic hit, but, you know, we did that. We did 12 live events, a few side events. You were involved in a, in a few of the, uh, I believe you were involved in some of the side events. We did a music show where you DJed and other stuff. Um, but yeah, and then we went virtual when we were no, it was no longer safe to be around each other, so. Hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. And I guess I didn't know sort of that backstory of Wolf. I'm, I'm sure if you and your brother could have done it all yourselves, I'm sure you would have loved to keep it in the family. <laughs> but it's awesome. It's been really cool. Kind of the weird, the weird local community that you've built up uh, over the past couple of years. It's really awesome to see that. And one of my favorite things throughout the pandemic was just kind of seeing that virtual festival take shape. Um, you kind of mix it up in terms of the actual production of that. Um, I'm sure you were using various streaming solutions. And at <laughs> one point, I think the first Wolf, it was streaming on Facebook. And then, OK, we're going to unlist this YouTube video. Everyone go watch that and then come back here on Facebook. <laughs> um, and then yeah, it, it kind of evolved a lot. Can, can you talk about just sort of how you picked up virtual production and how that changed as the year went on? No, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't do it alone. I like to say that I do because I don't know, I've been working with my therapist to try to let other people in to the process, but, uh, basically me and a bunch of co-organizers, uh, well, one of the co-organizers, he got an email from a local publication saying, Hey, if any of you have virtual events, you should let us know. And so we said we had a virtual event, even though none of us had any experience doing, um, extensive live streaming or anything like that. So we set a date for an event and we were gonna do the whole thing on Instagram. Uh, so Instagram Live for the hosted segments and then the blocks of films would be on Instagram for, yeah, we would we would put them up as IGTV videos. And that was, um, I think in March we did that. So everybody, people submitted 30 second um, films, I believe at that point. And it was really fun, it was chaotic. We didn't quite know what we were doing, um, but it, we had a good time. And But so we, we sort of kept, ironing it out. So a few months later, we did another one where we made it more of a scavenger hunt, which I thought would be fun. But, you know, I think people still had fun at that point because it was early in the pandemic and it hadn't been ironed out the correct ways to do these kinds of things. We were just kind of diving right in. So we made a Facebook Live event. We basically hosted it on Facebook Live and then we would put a link up on the screen and say, go to YouTube. And, uh, and then we put a link in the chat and it's like, you can see the first block of films here and we'll be back in 20 minutes with more live stuff. So we would switch between the Facebook live and then you were supposed to click and go away to YouTube. Um, but then I started learning OBS, uh, some switching live streaming software, and we put it all into just one YouTube video experience. So we had the live stuff and then we would go into the films, uh, once once we got verse. So that was three, four, and five. The the last three virtual events we did were all one link and you just stayed there. And I think that was that was the ultimate winner for <laughs> how we did things. Yeah, no, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And like I said, from from my end as the viewer and I think only one time submitter You're to the one, virtual festivals. Two. Yeah, maybe. But it was it was cool to see, you know, that happen in real time. For me it was really like, whoa, like, you know. Everyone loves putting on events. No one knows how to do it right now. And, you know, hat off, hats off to you and your team uh, for just kind of going with it, putting that pressure on yourselves you, and then figuring it out as, as time went on. I think uh, we saw in that last clip, you're definitely a bit of an OBS master now. We had some yeah. uh, shark overlays, <laughs> uh, some, some chickens. It looks like you kind of mastered all the tools of the trade for that. Thank you. Um, and, and <laughs> of course. And speaking about that clip, I was wondering, uh, can we believe the Peter from about a month ago in the end of no. that clip we just watched? Will Wolf be back in person in July? No, if you were still my intern, I would have reprimanded you heavily for doing that because uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, basically, we, we had an event set up for July, but unfortunately, we were supposed to leave the event by nine o'clock uh, due to city regulations and the sun won't even set until 8 30 so the ability to even see the films with a projector would have been hindered so unfortunately we are not going to be having that event in july we're taking the summer off but we're going to be back in the fall with with some awesome stuff um 
assuming public health is in a good place. But big things planned. Well, that's awesome. Sorry for putting you on the spot there, but just wanted no. to do a, a real-time <laughs> fact check. Um, but no, I mean, those kind of uh, issues, timing, projection, outdoors, like these are the issues we as events producers kind of have to think about, take into account, and you know, always kind of obsessively worry about. So totally understand yeah. that. Um, but I guess uh, transitioning just a little bit over to your um, day job at CCTV, you guys also kind of had to figure out a pretty big uh, production workflow transition there as well. Um, can yep. you talk a little bit about what it was like to take the whole uh, live recording uh, cable shows and putting those all streaming from home? Yeah, absolutely. So for those who don't know, CCTV Cambridge Community Television is a public access station. So we have uh, local Cambridge residents and uh, other people who come in and they make their own TV shows, documentaries, uh, podcasts, uh, just all kinds of media. So we have a, uh, a slew of maybe, I don't know, 40, 40, 45 live producers who create live shows that go right to cable television. Um, and so, yeah, so when the pandemic hit, we had to switch a lot of, well, as many of those shows as we could to from home production, which a lot of our members, um, are not as technologically savvy. You know, we have a lot of, uh, older members. We have a lot of people that maybe don't even own a computer. So, uh, so yes, we, we did a lot to try to figure out how to, uh, make it so people of all backgrounds and all technological know-how and income levels could if they wanted still have a live show during and be able to get their voice out even during this uh this wild wild time so it was a it, it was great uh, honestly i i wish we could have done more there's always that uh you know it's it's the people that are most in need that are the hardest to really address their needs especially the pandemic especially for people without technological know-how or the the setup already it, it was just really really difficult but we we had I, we got iPad kits into certain people's homes so they could make shows and have some you know internet. We did uh, yeah we we did phone in shows. We had people call from landlines. We did whatever we could to uh, to get all these producers that wanted to on the air and uh, have them have them say their piece. Hmm. That's that's awesome. Uh, love the resiliency both of the CCTV staff but also the CCTV producer community. Um, it's yeah, awesome amazing. that you can keep keep it chugging along. Um, and I guess my favorite thing uh, that I'm most excited for is later today, uh, in-person CCTV produced events are, are back uh, with some back, amount of, uh, regularity now as well. Uh, can you talk yeah. about the event you're producing in just a couple hours? Yeah, yeah, so, so, so excited to, uh, to feel the energy again. That's what's really, really just so motivating. But uh, so we're producing a local music showcase. So we're gonna have four greater Boston area artists come in and perform. We have a DJ. It's just gonna be a live event at an outdoor venue in Central Square called Starlight Square. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just it's just so exciting to feel the energy again um, after so many, so many months of isolation. And, you know, it's good to good to feel that again. So yeah, we, we did another show, Josh, you were at last month where we, we've been doing trivia shows. Like we we're trying to create a more regular trivia game show called who knows Cambridge. So people learn a little more about their town and it's kind of fun and goofy and it's, it's stolen from a bunch of trivia, <laughs> trivia shows that already exist, but it's this weird uh, Frankenstein monster that I created of trivia shows that are probably familiar, but you know, maybe we can elude uh, getting in trouble <laughs> because there's enough confusion between it, but it's uh it, yeah, it's been a lot of fun to just get people in the room and we started teaching outdoor production classes and other things and, yeah, it's been it's been great to have people come in person safely again, and uh, yeah, be able to see all the members and feel that energy. Yeah, I know. I'm looking forward to uh, attending tonight. Uh, it's really awesome what uh, Central Square and the City of Cambridge did with that Starlight Square. They took, I think, it was an old uh, parking spot and just converted it into an outdoor event space last summer. It's back this summer. Um, so yeah, it's really awesome that they're doing that, and you get the opportunity with your team to. Uh, put on some events there. Um, yeah, yeah, it's and pretty then, amazing. You should check, anybody should check it out. They have events every night, they're free, and they're, they're, they're having a roller skating event, I think, tomorrow night, where they're turning the whole thing into a roller skating uh, situation. So I don't know if my layman's terminology of that is right, but it's great, it's a very cool space. 
We'll we'll run that through uh, run that by our Rick <laughs> roller skating experts, but I think I think that'll uh, probably track with them as well. Um, but yeah, uh, kind of getting towards the end of our conversation here, Peter. Don't want to take up too much of your time, just since you are, you know, <laughs> putting on your producer director cap and running into that madness tonight. Uh, good luck with that event. I'll be there uh, with some friends. Really looking forward to the concert. Um, but. Lastly, just kind of on an ending note here, one of the things that's been most uh, impressive for me with all the stuff you've been doing this past year is just your regular uh, uploads to the Weird Local Productions YouTube channel. It seems like you really just kind of took the challenge on yourself to keep creating content. It seems like every week there's a new video or sketch or animation, just a kind of cool, weird thing that you've been working on. Um, so, you know, as a aspiring content creator, someone who wants to have that same level of output. That was really cool to see this past year. Um, so do you have any advice for people on how to stay creative? And I guess, uh, yeah, yeah. What, what, what do you do to stay creative when the world's uh, falling apart? Thanks, Josh. I really appreciate that. Um, it, I, I'm worried. I do worry that there's a compulsion for me. So my advice isn't always the right thing. I'm definitely, I have a lot of feelings. So uh, I always try to make stuff so I can put them in a direction. But uh, yeah, I definitely recommend uh, perfection's not, it's not your friend after a certain point. I think being afraid of, of, not, of, your, of your work not being perfect means you won't, you won't put out as much work, which I think is uh, something I see a lot of my peers and I've definitely struggled with, especially as a classical musician. I was so afraid of playing the cello and it not being perfect. But the only people that really care about the perfection are not the audience you even want. The people that are nitpicking your stuff, they have another agenda. So I think really trying to uh, get over the perfectionism and just try to figure out your message and get it to at least 80%, um, I think it's a great way. And I, I just believe the more you pump out, the more you're able to carve out your, your self-identity, recognize who you are as, a, as an artist, which I'm embarrassed to even say artist if I'm throwing videos on YouTube. But um, yeah, I, I, it is art. Every, you know, whatever you make is art. And I think uh, we should feel less shame about not being perfect with it because that's ridiculous. So that's my concise philosophy. Totally. And that's something uh, I, you know, struggle with as well. I've definitely had projects I've left on the cutting room floor just because I didn't think they were perfect. But, uh, you know, YouTube is where the art happens these days. We just got to throw stuff up and let the content speak for itself. So Peter, thanks again so much for coming on. I would like to leave you with one final question. Um, I think we're going to make a habit of asking all of our guests this on the show, deciding this right now. I haven't checked with any of the, the teams, but uh, <laughs> hey, Peter, how do you create smarter? Oh, man, I wish you had. Yeah, not, not to put you on the spot. This. All right. How do I create smarter? I don't think about how smart my creation is. I, I, I try to I try to play a little dumb sometimes because I think as creators it is easy to overthink everything. So I'm trying to figure out the places where you have to strategize and the places where you have to play dumb because anxiety always does play in anytime you put something out. So I have no idea if I answered your question, but yeah. No, definitely. That was good enough. Uh, for sure. We'll have to have you back on the program for uh, the Create Dumber show next week uh, when, we, <laughs> when we talk about all the benefits of uh, different styles of production. But thanks so much, Peter. Really appreciate the time and good luck with that uh, event tonight. Really looking forward to being there in the audience. And I'm sure the folks watching CCTV will uh, enjoy watching the show in a couple weeks as well. Thank you so much, Josh. Appreciate all of this. Thank you. Awesome. Well, that's been it for uh, me here on the uh, Create Smarter interview hour. Uh, thanks again to Peter and uh, Cambridge Community Television and the Weird Local Film Festival. That's it from me. Let's get back on over to our main man, Tyler. And uh, yeah, Tyler, uh, how's, how's it going? Join the conversation to be totally honest with you. Great stuff from you and Peter. Um, you know, love some of the things that Peter was saying, you know, when she, he talked about in the middle of it about just trying everything to see what could work and what stuck. You know, that that's sometimes the advice that we give to everybody. Just try something, see what works. And then obviously when he kind of wrapped things up towards the end before you made the judgment call of create smarter. How do you create smarter at the end of every show? Which is a good idea. I like it. But he had talked about going into, you know, perfection. 
right? And that's something we struggle with and we talk about with our clients all the time, right? And one of our clients at Brandeis University, uh, University actually had a, a wonderful comment one time that's kind of stuck out in my head. It's like, don't let perfect get in the way of something that's great, right? Because there is never, ever going to be something that is absolutely perfect. And it's perfection is, is subjective, really, at the, at the end of the day. So I really loved um, some of the stuff that Peter just said. So big thanks to Peter. Big thanks to you, Josh. And I guess we'll just keep on trucking down the road right now. So with all that in mind, um, you know, we talked about events and we talked about, uh, you know, event production. However, really, as you saw in the beginning of the show, and we took back, uh, took a look at May, it's not all about event production, right? A lot of the content that we actually have been putting together as of lately isn't necessarily events. It's more feature stories, if you will. So just uh, you know, a couple of days ago, Connor and I had the uh, great opportunity to go on site at Spalding um, Hospital to kind of hear one story. That story is going to be coming out uh, fairly soon, but here's a behind the scenes look at kind of everything that went into that shoot. Hey guys, Marissa from Five Tool Productions here. Jason and I just wrapped up a shoot on this very rainy Tuesday morning at Spalding and Wellesley. Um, we actually got to get some B-roll of a procedure, so that was pretty cool. And then this afternoon, we're heading to Spalding and Cambridge to order to do the same thing, get some B-roll, um, get some shots of the doctors in their labs. And then later this week, Connor and Jason will be heading to Charlestown to do a very similar thing. So it's a week full of Spalding, a week full of B-roll, and we are here to show you all of the behind the scenes. We just wrapped up filming at Spalding Rehabilitation in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where we got to work with a doctor inside the Inspire Lab. And we got to see some patients in action who are rehabilitating here. And it was a whole entire cool process to see. We got a tour of the whole entire Inspire Lab. And it is just one great thing to witness. So on Thursday, Connor and I will actually be going to another location in Charlestown to film more with Spalding Rehabilitation to create a wonderful piece that will be coming out very soon. So cool to see that. And to be completely honest with you, it just shows how often we've actually been working with Spalding Rehab lately because there's been several shoots over the course of the last couple of weeks. And that was the other one that I wasn't on. So, of course, I'm always thinking about being never anybody else. So that's why I kind of threw that one up there. So my apologies entirely. But that video actually turned out great. The final product, the client loved it. And uh, we have another one which Connor is putting together the behind the scenes right now as we speak. Actually, not as we speak, probably once we wrap up 
this show because if he tries to do it while he's producing it's just not going to work that good but anyways we're going to move on right now we've got one last thing we want to get to so we always love to kind of end the show with some sort of how to so today we want to show off something called the kill of you encoder so that is basically how you can stream things right now we're using um, a teradeck encoder but we've got a few new ones in stock or in st the studio itself and we use it for a few different reasons to get it up to the internet but also to bring different cameras into our production switcher itself so without further ado here's josh again taking you through the kill of you hi there everybody it's josh your friendly neighborhood video content producer here at five tool productions now uh just sort of wanted to welcome you into what's going to be kind of a tech explainer video kind of a how-to wanted to show off what i've been working on this week with our kill of you encoders and video converters this here is one of their encoders, uh, but we are really using it because it can convert a uh, video signal to NDI. So we have two uh, varieties of that. We have the SDI converter for your SDI video input, as well as your HDMI for your HDMI video input. Um, and I know what you're probably saying, Josh, those converter encoder boxes sound awesome. I'd love to have them, but uh, what do they do? How do I use them? Don't worry, I've got you. Um, what we've been using it for is we want to get another camera set up in our studio. We've got a Sony 6400 camera here. So I'm just gonna turn this on and uh, plug it into a mini HDMI. That goes uh, down to a real HDMI out, and that goes all the way down uh, into one of these awesome mini HDMI to SDI converter boxes. It's called the, the Canix Pro. We are converting that signal from the camera to HDMI. We're converting it to SDI, and that's where uh, one of these Kiloview encoder converter boxes comes into play, going to uh, plug that into the power. I'm also going to connect it uh, with this ethernet cord to our wireless network, like so. And uh, you know what? Probably need to connect that uh, video signal as well. So SDI out of the HDMI to SDI converter. Make sure you put it on uh, the one that says in, not the one that says loop. That'll loop it don't want that um but then flip of the switch back here we are getting lights we are probably connecting to the network right now so i'm going to turn on this camera and uh yeah so we kind of avoided using these big boxes thanks to the mini converters and uh, now we are just about ready to get this camera on the network so if I go over here to our VMix machine, it's what we use for all of our live switching. Should be able to pull in the camera as a uh, input and might be able to see that there. Uh, it's, it's coming in in just about real time. We also need to do an audio uh, input. For right now, uh, we're using the Sony 6400. So now we have that there. I'll just grab my handy dandy lav mic as well. And now we have a uh, hard audio uh, line in coming out of our camera. And uh, if I turned that audio back on and maybe set up a little more settings in the back end of the uh, Kiloview encoder, we'd be getting live video and audio from this camera that we can pull in on any of our uh, vMix switchers on the network in the office. So control room one, control room two, or this roaming laptop here. And you know, I'm wearing a lav mic, but if I wasn't already, I'd just clip this one on here and that'd be a done deal. So, you know, bit of a bit of a mess with everything, but uh, we are going from the camera, converting it from HDMI to SDI, and then converting SDI to NDI. And yeah, we're gonna go get a cool little camera wall mount over here. So this camera will just permanently live here, pointing over there. I don't know if lav mic will be what we go with, maybe shotgun, who knows, but we'll be able to basically just turn this camera on. It'll be pointing at the wall, 
and then we can make our own content. Thanks for joining me on this explainer tech uh, kind of walkthrough video today. Hope you learned something new. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for watching. I've been Josh from Five Tool Productions, and uh, we'll see you next time. I love it. Josh's fingerprints are all over today's episode. Really good stuff. Thank you, Josh, for uh, taking us through the kill of you. Pretty cool little thing that that can do um, for all sorts of different scenarios, to be totally honest with you. So that'll do it for today's show. Great stuff by Connor in the back. Good job by Marissa putting together a lot of these behind the scenes clips. And of course, Josh, for getting some wonderful guests helping put this entire show together. So, and of course, it wouldn't be a show without you. So thank you to all that tuned in. That'll do it for me. We'll, we'll see you next time right here on Create Smarter. Take care.